the only possible way to convince desperate people to fight for social change is to convince them that you are there to see you there present on their daily life helping them to put bread on the table again this week on the show, a new Republican-led Congress is in power in Washington. Pennsylvania health care reformer Chuck Panacchio says that's no time to ramp down grassroots action, rather to ratchet it up. Speaking of elections, with the anti-austerity party Syriza leading in the polls in the run-up to a vote in Greece, we hear from a representative what they're all about. And I have a few things to say about oil profits and Nigerian schoolgirls. Here's the hashtag, profits matter most. Has Obamacare killed single payer? Our next guest is fighting to keep the idea of national health reform alive. Chuck Panacchio is executive director of Healthcare for All Pennsylvania and founder of Citizen Solutions for Pennsylvania. He was a 2006 U.S. Senate candidate and he's a longtime advocate of publicly financed, privately provided universal health care, as well as an organizing veteran of some 30 years. Welcome to the program, Chuck. Glad to have you. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it. I got an email from you. I think it was like the day after the midterm elections where everybody who pays a lot of attention to U.S. electoral results uh, was feeling fairly down in the dumps, but not you. How come? We have amazing opportunities on the horizon. I think that if people keep their eye on the ball, we can achieve single-payer health care reform, beginning at the state level, and then create a just a tidal wave of other states now, adopting it. What gives you this confidence, Chuck? What gives me this confidence <laughs> is that, well, what you mentioned at the top, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, same thing, um, provide a, a pivot for the states to innovate on health care reform so long as those reforms hit at least the baseline of what Obamacare provides. And we far exceed that, our legislation. And there are 26 states in the United States that are moving forward on such legislation. Places like Hawaii, California, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And we've got a, a number of governors out there who are beginning to embrace this idea because the way we're going right now on healthcare spending is unsustainable and it's crushing our economy. All right, so just to re recap for people who maybe <clears throat> haven't checked in on this story for a while, maybe they thought that Obamacare solved all the problems. Um, U.S. health care is unlike health care in most other developed nations. How? The insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, big hospitals, and the medical device manufacturers have created a consortium of power we call it the medical industrial complex, and they've hijacked our politics. They've bought off politicians, and they have done everything they can to block serious movement forward on health care reform. And quite honestly, Obamacare falls woefully short of achieving what we need. Health care for all, affordable, uh, un un unobstructed access, giving people what they need when they need it in a way that doesn't crush our economy and doesn't devastate people's lives. Now, a lot of people look at Obamacare, the, the Affordable Care Act that the Obama administration was able to get passed eventually, and say single payer is a pipe dream under the system that you just described. Yeah. Those private insurers aren't going anywhere. That um, consortium, others call it a monopoly or even a conspiracy, um, hasn't faded in its strength or power. Um, how do you come away feeling nonetheless that there is possibility for change. Specifically, there's a, a provision of the Affordable Care Act, of Obamacare, called at Section 1332, that allows for state innovation. And we've done economic studies in about a dozen states that demonstrate the, the, the wisdom of single payer. You did one finance. in Pennsylvania. You want to talk about what you found? Correct. Uh, Gerald Friedman, who is an economist at University of Massachusetts Amherst, came into Pennsylvania and found that we're currently spending $125 billion on health care. $125 billion. This is and one a, state. That's right. Just Pennsylvania. And a third of that, one third of those dollars, about $40 billion, is lost on what are called administrative costs. That's the profit first insurance industry. They take their money before anybody's health care is paid for. They spend millions of dollars on marketing, 
uh, obscene salaries for their CEOs. They're in the healthcare industry and people are walking away with, with $10 million plus salaries in Pennsylvania. Plus, the, you know, in, in the United States, we have Blue Cross Blue Shield, mm -hmm. which is this nonprofit entity, but they behave exactly like corporations. And in Pennsylvania, they control 86% of the market. So I spend most of my time actually talking to Republican legislators, and they actually feel comfortable with a conversation of states leading the way. Mm. Ours is a federal constitution, similar to Canada, and almost all the innovations historically have come up through the states. So if, well, let's talk about the place that you think is closest. Um, it was at one point Vermont that looked closest to getting single payer. Right. Now you're saying it's more like Hawaii. Can you explain? Uh, David Iggy, who actually beat um, uh, Neil Abercrombie in the Democratic primary in Hawaii. This is a little bit of inside baseball. Yeah. But you have a more committed progressive uh, individual, somebody who's more committed to enacting single-payer legislation in Hawaii than the past previous uh, Democratic governor who was voted out in the in the in this election cycle. And how would it work there? It would be publicly funded and privately uh, delivered health care for all. Everybody pays a fair share tax, about three cents of your dollar, a three percent tax, and businesses pay about ten percent of payroll tax. Currently, people are paying about 8% of their income, and businesses are currently paying about 25%. Mm. Huge savings. How come? The savings come from eliminating the insurance industry as the middleman, because they not only scrape a third of every healthcare dollar off the top before any healthcare is actually delivered, but they block decision making. They deny people care. They deny people care on the basis of what they call experimental, uh, treatments or pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. The insurance industry is there to make money. That's their only purpose. They do. They provide no service. And increasingly, people are understanding that that's actually happening. What, the real test, I think, for healthcare, and this is what single payer focuses on, is giving people choice. Mm -hmm. Giving people choice of their provider. And frankly, for Republicans, that's an acceptable idea because that's the market. No, I don't know about you, but a lot of the doctors that I ever visit or would like to visit don't take any insurance. One of the fears I hear from people, um, people who usually have insurance, right. is that they'll lose their doctors they have now because they're not going to want to deal with government insurance. Um, they're not going to want to deal with the bureaucracy that they associate with public administration. Can you set them straight? Absolutely. Currently, right now, the insurance industry are the ones who obstruct your being able to choose. If you're in an insurance plan, you are limited to uh, a finite number of doctors and hospitals and other providers. Under single-payer health care, the, the options go wide open, so people can choose whoever they want. There's transparency in the system, and essentially, doctors... Uh, hospitals uh, compete based on their track records. You get to choose who you want for your care. But it does depend on the doctors opting into the system. Well, the incentive for the doctors being in the system is so overwhelming because they are paid a fair market share. In other words, they're going to get a fair compensation. They're going to get it promptly, unlike what the insurance industry does, and they're not going to have to fight the bureaucracy to get their money and to make sure that their mm -hmm. patients are not being gouged. So it's a win-win-win across the board. Now tell me how you came to this issue as your primary issue. You're somebody who worked in the anti-nuclear movement, who's had a long history, I think I said three decades. Um, four. I, four. <laughs> um, healthcare is the priority now for you, though. Yeah. I see healthcare as the tipping point issue. This is the issue that affects, touches more people's lives than any other issue. To me, I come at this, this as an organizer and somebody who believes in, in the pro-democracy movement. So I, I, I constantly am connecting the dots, right? It's not just healthcare we're talking about. It's the economy we're talking about. It's people's lives that we're talking about. It's people's ability to, to get a, an education that they want, the ability to work in a job that they want, uh, the ability for people to move around the economy. I mean, one of the problems with our current system is what's called job lock. People are stuck in jobs because they have insurance there and they, they don't dare leave that job. And the employer knows their employees aren't help, are, are not happy and they're not as productive as they could be. It benefits employers mm -hmm. to let their employees explore, you know, open a new business, go back to school, and this will liberate our economy. All right, so talk to people who are looking at the beginning of the new year, 
who care about social change, who feel pretty bummed about the record of the Obama administration, rightly or wrongly, right. who feel the midterms were a disaster. There's a tendency out there to just turn off this whole field of electoral politics and say it's hopeless. Right. We're about to enter into another probably nauseating electoral season right. where we spend billions of dollars on a kind of horse race uh, campaign for president. Yeah. Talk to those folks, because you're used to talking to them. Absolutely. Um, I think moods need to be shifted a bit. Yeah. Well, the real political game right now is not electoral politics. It's grassroots politics. It's people taking matters into their own hands. And we have to bring pressure to bear on individuals who are running for office now and in the future. But the, the, we can't think that our democracy begins and ends with elections. We can't think of it as a process that is completed. I mean, democracy is a way of life. It's a culture. It's, it's an engagement. It's the ability to understand how, well, the power that you have. And you're right. A lot of people are feeling very disempowered. And I think deeply disappointed, especially in the Democratic Party, who have lost their way. They genuinely have lost their way. They've lost touch with the base of the party, with the economic justice and economic rights mission. The modern Democratic Party was born out of the Roosevelt years in the 1930s, carried on by Harry Truman, John Kennedy, and so forth. And that party has lost its way. They've given over so much of the economic issues to corporate interests. And I think more people are understanding that that's the reality and that the real issues have to be solved by us on the ground. We are the leaders that we've been looking for. I mean, it makes me crazy. The election of last fall, the midterms, feels to me exactly like the midterms of 2006. Uh, and at that moment, people were saying progressive movements are accomplishing more than the Democratic Party. It wasn't progressive issues that failed or lost. It was progressive organ. It was organ. It was the lack of progressive organizing by Democratic candidates. Was nothing learned really? I think you're right. A lot was not learned. I mean, it was a similar election where you saw yes. electoral losses for the Democratic Party, right. but victories in the states around minimum wages, around paid sick days, right. around even immigration, and certainly LGBT reforms. Right, right. Well, again, I, I, I don't spend a lot of time focusing on the political campaigns. I spend a lot of time focusing on people and organizing and really being smart about this. It doesn't matter ultimately in, in most cases who's elected. If you, can, if you can put enough pressure on individuals, they will move in your direction. Because the job of a politician is what? To get elected. What's their next job? To get reelected. And, and they typically follow the money unless they hear from their constituents, unless people actually rise up and demand the kind of a world that we want. And I feel like we're at a tipping point right now, Laura. I feel like we're in a very good position to enact single payer in one, two, three states. And once that happens, and this is what Jerry Friedman's economic study shows, we are going to not only see our health care system resolve, but we're going to create jobs. We're going to make our economy come back to life again. And we're going to push aside these medical industrial companies, the insurance companies, the, the pharmaceuticals, the big hospitals, and the medical manufacturers. They need to be brought to uh, under regulation. And we need to start joining the rest of the civilized world and provide health care for all Americans. So finally, a question for you about Pennsylvania. Sure. Um, again, electoral season, whether we like it or not. Um, we may say, see a, a female candidate running, I can't imagine who, for president. <laughs> um, the issue of reproductive rights is going to become an electoral um, batting ball again. Right. Um, sometimes it gets siloed into women's issues only. Right. Roe v. Wade, uh, abortion rights. In your state, there's a very clear story of how reproductive issues affected the political spectrum every issue. Mm -hmm. Can you lay that out for us? Well, I think you're probably referring to the Casey phenomenon. Uh, this is uh, Robert Casey Sr., who ran for governor four times, finally won the fourth time. James Carville ran his final successful campaign, and then it, it basically set the stage for his son, uh, Bob Casey Jr., who's now a U.S. Senator from Pennsylvania. And what the politics of the Casey phenomenon have done is they've given uh, the ability for Democrats or people who are anti-choice to join the party. Mm -hmm. And it, Pennsylvania is a very... Anti-choice yeah, Democrat. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to see a lot more of it over the next two years, this discussion about whether it's 
worth it on balance for the party, the Democratic Party, to permit an anti-choice Democrat to have such a leading position and get the, the backing of the federal party um, when it's terrible for the issues? Right. And it seems to me it's been part of what led to the problem that you described in the first place of the Democrats kind of losing their way in this hole. Yeah. I think it's a fight that has to come from us. The Democratic Party is lost, fundamentally lost. I don't think that they're willing to take that issue on among uh, conservative Democrats, socially conservative Democrats, anti-choice Democrats. I don't see it. What has to happen is there has to be a groundswell. And that's why I ran for U.S. Senate in 2006, because we've got to speak up. And frankly, people came out of the woodwork. And this is actually the basis of our single-payer campaign. People say, gosh, Chuck, I'm sorry you lost that election. I didn't lose the election. I've been working at this for 40 years. You look at the long arc of your activity and the history, and you realize that people who are energized by the issues, and that's what you're about, Laura, is that's the people who are most eager to see change. Those are the folks who, who will roll up their sleeves and do the hard work. And ultimately, we will, we will turn the Bob Casey's of the world out of office, but it has to happen, I think, from the grassroots up. Chuck Panacchio, thanks so much for coming in. It's great to have you, and good yeah. luck with your work. Thanks so much, Laura. Syriza is a political experiment, actually. It's something more than a political party. It's a political experience to overcome the, the historical deficiencies of the left and the fragmentations of the left, not only in Greece, but also in Europe and globally. In a sense, a large proportion of the Greek society, the Greek electorate specifically, used to vote for two destructive political parties, the Social Democrats and the right wing. Those were the parties that uh, applied this neoliberal project uh, <laughs> that uh, deprived ordinary people from their access to commons, to basic services, to natural resources. Greece has been a guinea pig of neoliberalism. It has been a field of biopolitical experimentation on the new normality that the neoliberal plan wants to bring uh, all over Europe. This new normality that has to do with turning the European Union into a more competitive force in capitalist terms against the emerging forces, for example, of the BRICS, like Brazil, India, Russia, China, South Africa, uh, in the game of global neoliberal economy. So in order to boost a program of job creation, and to exit recession, we need to make some immediate changes uh, in contrast with the current neoliberal paradigm. We need to stop the austerity programs. We need to have a public intervention in the, pub in the banking sector in order to radically change the crediting policy for the small and medium business and the households. And we need to achieve public investments to ensure that we find the funds uh, from a national and European level in order to promote public investments for safe job creations, for stable job creations, for decent employment. Because with an unemployment rate of 30% and the society experiencing a humanitarian crisis, you can never exit the current economic crisis. The victims of this humanitarian crisis in many cases are people who get isolated, extremely excluded, stay at home, they become desperate and they feel fear. And these are conservative feelings. And that's why many of these people tend to the neo-fascist gang of the Golden Dawn in the last elections. That's why we are trying to convince people that we need collective action for collective problems. And the best way to convince these people, the victims of the crisis, is not by charismatic speeches done by balconies. The best way is to give concrete political examples. And the concrete political examples are given through our daily presence in the neighborhood, in the local scale, in the field that our compatriots, that our neighbors 
are experiencing the crisis. And that's why Syriza activists at present are engaged in more than, more than 150 local networks of solidarity. They are networks working horizontally. They are not trying to build a philanthropical, vertical power relation with the citizens. They work horizontally in order to convince people that in order to face the common opponents, the common enemy, we need to work together in order to ensure that we have electricity in our houses, running water, in order to ensure that if the state excludes us from public health care system and from uh, free drugs, we will have the volunteer doctors of the health care centers and the volunteer drugstores organized in a magnificent way throughout Greece in order to ensure that there will be no people dying of curable diseases, there will be no people dying of hunger. There are thousands of households who cannot afford to pay their electricity bills. This means that there are thousands of households who lose access to the electricity network. In these cases, when we're talking about poor neighborhoods, the volunteer electrician of the local network of solidarity visits the house of the family next day and illegally reconnects the electricity. The only possible way to convince desperate people to fight for social change is to convince them that you are there to see you there, present on their daily life, helping them to put bread on the table again. This is the beginning of all kinds of social struggles. Don't be afraid to act against an enemy that seems invincible, but actually is not. The United Nations has called on the government of Nigeria to restore law and order in the northeast of that country and investigate mass killings alleged to have been carried out by the militant group Boko Haram. Boko Haram is the same lot that last spring kidnapped 276 girls, most of whom have never been recovered. This January, while world attention was focused on the killings in Paris, Boko Haram waged an assault on two northern towns Satellite imagery shows them raised to the ground. The Nigerian government says 150. Amnesty International says as many as 2,000 or more were left dead. The exact numbers of dead are hard to confirm, of course, but one thing is pretty certain. If profits, not poor people's lives, were at stake, the world would hardly be silent. Black lives don't matter as much as white to the West, that's clear, but everywhere, hashtag profits matter most. Western media stereotypes notwithstanding, Nigeria is not some tin pot state. The largest economy on the continent, a founding member of OPEC, one of the world's leading oil producers, Nigeria has seen billions of oil dollars flow through it. The lion's share to global corporations, but the oil giants have kicked back plenty to Nigerian leaders in exchange for protection of their interests. The military's annual budget exceeds $6 billion and they've never been reluctant to use it to protect oil profits. In the mid-1990s, for example, when demonstrations by the people of Ogoniland threatened to shut down oil production in the south, much of the Niger Delta was simply put under military rule, and maintaining law and order led to the killing of leading Ogoni activists, including Ken Sarawiwa and others. When a Chevron platform was occupied, the company hired a helicopter to fly armed forces in. Two unarmed protesters were shot dead. So what's the world to do? Nigerians are going to the polls in mid-February, and that could bring about a change. But it's not the government of Nigeria that's poor, only the vast majority of its people. More international oil money going to taxes and things like those that the Ogoni activists were asking for, schools, clean water, and health care, might have led to more democracy and less corruption. Maybe less of that military budget would be ending up now in generals' pockets. If poverty was a bit less dire and popular discontent a bit less severe, I don't know, the place today just might be less fertile territory for maniacs promising vengeance. Would the West care more if Nigerians were white? No doubt. But for sure, if you could make money from schoolgirls, the most powerful people in the world would be all over this. Write to me, tell me what you think. Laura at GritTV.org. The 
The center of gravity of the movement was grassroots organizing, was frontline communities, was alliances between um, communities of color, indigenous communities, working class white folks. Like you saw a different face of the movement. We see this as a growing movement around systems change, not climate change. A relatively unknown story is captured in the film We Are Many. We talk to the filmmaker. Amir Amirani. There's been a sh structural shift in the public mm. against war. And Phyllis Bennis, author of, among other things, Challenging Empire. Democracy in this country is so flawed, so under the control of corporate interests and big money, that public opinion means very little these days. Mm.